Good afternoon, friends, Athenaeum members and visitors. We're so glad to have you here with us this afternoon for a special program at the Athenaeum. I am Beth Hessel, the executive director. We also have Tess Galen, our events coordinator, who helped make sure you, you were able to get on and enjoy this, this program. And Candace Hesselbart is our special guest today. Candace started working at the Athenaeum about nine, 10 months ago as we uh, extended our hours as an assistant librarian while she finished her final year in the MSLIS program at Drexel University. Um, she has been such a fabulous staff member here and we're about to lose her as she goes to work at the um, Historical Medical Library at the College of Physicians in Philadelphia. But while she's been here, she also um, used our archives for her capstone project at Drexel as part of her degree. Um, so as, as part of this, uh, this capstone requirement, she worked with the Athenaeum processing our Thomas Eustick Walter archival manuscript collection. And this is the first time that these, uh, these, this, this amazing archive has been processed. So she is going to share with us some of what she has been learning through the process of uh, processing um, these, these records about the uh, building of the Girard College for Orphans in Philadelphia. So I invite you all to join me in welcoming Candace. And if you have questions at any time, you can put them in the chat or the Q&A. And I will moderate those after she finishes her talk. So welcome to Candace. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start my presentation. Hi. <laughs> All right. Let's see here. There we go. Just moving some things around so that I can see my screen. There we go. All right, so thank you everyone for coming. Um, again, my name is Candace Hesselbart. Um, I was, I am retiring as the first assistant librarian at the Athenaeum of Philadelphia. Um, the Athenaeum is, as Beth mentioned, the principal repository for the archive of 19th century Philadelphia architect Thomas Eustick Walter. Um, he's best known as the designer of the dome and wings of the United States Capitol building, but his first major commission was Philadelphia's Girard College for Orphans. Um, known as the epitome of Greek revival style, the structure was the single most expensive building in America prior to the Civil War when it was being built. Um, so this, again, is part of what was my capstone requirement for my graduation with my Master's of Science in Information and Library and Information Science with Drexel University. Um, the requirement essentially is to provide students with professional experience in different areas of librarianship or whatever field they desire um, that will be of benefit to them um, as they move into their professional careers when they graduate. And I did graduate just last or two weeks ago on Thursday. <laughs> um, so the purpose of my capstone was to provide new and additional information in regards to the existing manuscript series of Thomas Eustick Walter. Um, my work was analyzing the existing manuscript records and submissions to the 1832 architectural competition uh, for which Thomas Eustick Walter was eventually chosen as well as the bids for construction, the correspondences during construction and various other related archival materials. I generated descriptions of these materials with an, ex an existing Excel spreadsheet and created a digital item list and a collection summary of the materials that will eventually be combined with digital scans that will be linked to PAD, which you see here I have a screen flipping clipping, excuse me, of the uh, website, which is the Athenaeum's Philadelphia Architects and Building Project, which is a free online database supported by the William Penn Foundation. So the college's namesake is a gentleman named Stephen Gerard. He was born May 20th, 1750 in a suburb of Bordeaux, France, and in 1776 settled as a merchant in Philadelphia. However, 80 years after his birth, he was hit by a horse and wagon while crossing 2nd and Market Streets here in Philly. He never recovered and eventually died on December 26 of 1831. 
thought to be the wealthiest man in America at the time of his death, he left his entire fortune to charitable and municipal institutions in Philadelphia and New Orleans. Influenced by the innovative institutions being created in Philadelphia at the time in the 19th century, including the Eastern State Penitentiary to tackle criminal justice reform, the Pennsylvania Hospital, which was established to help with those with mental illness, and the Franklin Institute, which expanded and made accessible scientific knowledge to the masses, Gerard sought to address the challenge of educating future generations of American children. So he directed the city of Philadelphia to use his money to build a boarding school for poor orphan, at that time interpreted as fatherless white boys. Gerard left specific instructions in his will for the building dimensions and plan, as well as all aspects of the school. How specific were these instructions? Well, here you see just four pages of his will that are only outlining the initial college structure, which is known as Founders Hall. Uh, however, I will be referring to that as the main building at, for this presentation, as that's majority is what it is referred to by Walter. Gerard identifies the physical location of the grounds, measurements for the length and width of the building, the number of rooms per floor and their space, the location of the doors of the building, uh, the marble that will be used for the steps, as well as their dimensions, the depth of the foundation, the dimensions of the wall surrounding the entire campus. This entire will is available through the Internet Archive, if anyone would like to look it up. It is free to read. Um, but as we are diving into the construction of the structure, we'll hit many of these requirements that he has outlined in his will. So following his death, uh, members were created for the building committee for the Girard College and were appointed by the Select and Common Council of Philadelphia. And in 13, 1832, this committee held an architectural competition to award the job of designing school buildings with a $2 million budget, which was a significant budget again at that time. And these proposals had to adhere to guidelines presented in the will. And the winning entry that was chosen was that of Thomas U. Stick Walter. Um, Thomas Eustick Walter was a former bricklayer born in Philadelphia and is widely recognized, again, as the leading American architect of the mid-19th century. Um, some of his buildings, aside from Girard College, include the Andalusia Historic House, the Philadelphia County Prison at, Prison at Moyamensing. He was the fourth architect of the U.S. Capitol for designing that dome and wings. And he was also one of the founders and second president of the American Institute for Architects. Uh, this portrait that you see on the right is part of the Athenames collection and shows him at the start of his career. Behind him, you can see a fluted column of Girard College, and although it is far in the distance, there is a view of the county prison at Moyamensing as well. Both of these were designed in, in design and under construction at the time that this portrait was completed, hence their inclusion. Um, also, I know as I am from Maine and I have some family here, uh, Walter also designed Bug Light, which is a well-known lighthouse in South Portland, so I thought that was a fun little tidbit. So in total, here is the, uh, here is the archival collection that we have um, at the, at the um, Athenaeum, and included in this collection, aside from multiple materials, uh, is the one specific to Girard College. In total, this collection includes nine individual architects or firms who submitted proposals. Most are four pages long, many mentions figures, drawings, and some include sketches, although not all within the Athenaeum's archival collection have retained these materials. Here we see Thomas C. Stickwalter's original submission. It was trifolded for sending through the mail with two of the wax seals used to retain the fold on the left-hand page, left-hand side of the page, excuse me. Uh, there are references to plates indicating there were illustrations in coordination with this submission, and this document alone is 13 pages covering every aspect outlined in Gerard's will. Um, he introduces his submission, noting that, quote, he made a tour through the eastern states and visited various colleges that are located in that section of the country, as well as the University of Virginia, Virginia in Charlottesville to emphasize his expertise. 
Um, there are also signatures of support within this proposal from several of the committee members that further emphasized showing his existing support as an architect. And on the right, you can see the original design that he created prior to that proposal submission um, within the same month by the date. And you will see how that drawing kind of has changed and become what the Gerard College looks like today. Some of those who submitted proposals for the college entered more than one item. <laughs> this is uh, Michael de Chalmere. His initial proposal was 18 pages and included several images like this colored insert, which proposed the building wall composition. His second submission on the right, which is only four pages, less provides new design ideas, but rather encourages the committee to look back at his designs should they not be satisfied with any of the other submissions that they've received, writing of his confidence in his skills as an architect. Um, these two items were actually my first experience in issues regarding the organization of this archival collection. Upon initial acquisition, and organization and the processing of these materials, these submissions were not placed in chronological order. They each had an official folder number, like those folders that you saw earlier. So I was not able to change the uh, numbers associated with these items. However, there are some folders that contain multitudes, multiple materials. And in that case, when there's multiple items, I am the first one to be numbering them. And so I was able to shuffle some things around and make more sense. Um, lining them up in chronological order. Here is another submission by uh, Town Davis and Dakin. Um, this is from an arch architectural firm out of New York. Due to the deadline for the competition submissions, their initial design drawings and report explains at its introduction on the left that their proposals for the outbuildings could not be finished in time. And thus on the right, you can see it was set at a later date. The following year in the spring of 1833, an advertisement was published in Philadelphia for workers and materials for the building of the college. Here are a few examples of the letters received by the committee from companies offering their services to help build. Uh, these examples are addressed to either the committee or John Gilder, Esquire. John Gilder, at the onset of the planning of the building of Gerard College, was the committee chair um, and was also an elected member of the Philadelphia Common Council from 1831 to 1838. So starting at the end of June of 1833, I saw that these letters are majority addressed to Thomas Eustick Walter. Uh, most likely, this is due to his official assignment as the head architect and the need for his involvement in the hiring and beginning planning stages of the process of building the college. You can also see here my difficulty in deciphering every word or letter in these manuscripts as handwriting varied. <laughs> uh, when I determined that my deciphering was inconclusive after looking through a magnifying glass, comparing other materials as well as responses with names and addresses, or searching directories if I needed to find names. Um, if I was still unsure, you can see um, in that third um, submission that there is a bracket with the letter X in there. And that I will put an X for the number of letters that were included in that word or name um, that I could not understand. I also have on the bottom right transcribed just to get you an idea of some of the uh, context of the letters that were sent when people were providing their services. Uh, the majority of the proposals between May and June of 1833 are for bricks, lime, and sand, the main components of the foundation of the structure. Uh, this is a proposal from John Grimm. He was a Philadelphia brick, brick maker and had a brickyard on Poplar Lane. Uh, here it is, you can see how most of the mail was folded at the time. You can see it was tri-folded and then quad-folded as well with remnants of that wax seal to keep it intact into a small square pocket with simply the title of the committee as the address. And you can see as well, I've zoomed in there, a label added by Thomas Eustick Walter indicating the subject and the individual who sent the correspondences. 
So to get an idea of the work that I was doing, here's a snippet of my Excel spreadsheet. Um, <laughs> I, uh, each tab you see at the bottom is how I group together various folders of information organized based on the subject. You can see the details that I added for each item as well, their initial folder number, um, the item number I assigned to each manuscript, the number of pages, days, authors, dedicated recipients. Um, I also gave a brief description, often based on the labels by Thomas Eustick Walter, and I then commented on the pages, including any unique information on the right um, of the item that I was describing. So in 1833, on July 4th, there was an official announcement of the building of Girard College. Here we see a clipped and edited typed draft of the public announcement read by Nicholas Biddle, who was the president of the time. Uh, again, this document was labeled because Thomas Eustick Walter kept his records detailed and organized. <laughs> so almost every item in this archive that I processed had a label in his handwriting. Um, and in the same location on relatively every document. And when necessary, he used names and dates as well. Um, I will show some of those, more of those examples you'll see throughout this, uh, this presentation. This announcement uh, does start, fellow citizens, we have now witnessed the laying of the cornerstone of the Girard College for Orphans. That stone, simple, massive, and enduring, fit emblem of the structure to be reared from it and of the man whose name it bears has been deposited in its final resting place. So again, this was a uh, very special occasion and this was a very significant structure for the city of Philadelphia. So again, Nicholas Biddle, uh, he was a legislator and president of the Second Bank of the United States and was a prominent family, the Biddle family in Philadelphia. Uh, Biddle joined many Philadelphia civic organizations including the Athenaeum, which he helped found in 1814. He went on to serve both houses of the Pennsylvania State Legislature and eventually as president of the Girard College Board of Trustees, and also referring to the list of um, accomplishments of Thomas Eustick Walter, he did have Thomas Eustick Walter design and build his Andalusia historic home, his family home. So this here is Thomas Eustick Walter's book of contracts to keep track of all of the people that he worked with in the process of this construction. The contracts are dated between 1833 and 1846. Uh, you can see that each contract includes parties of the agreement, the location of where the work was to be done, schedule of work, and the signatures of those involved as well as a witness. The example on the right is a contract for Davis Henderson, a marble quarryman at the site of the aforementioned college on the Ridge Road north of Girard Street in the County of Philadelphia, convened and agreed by the said parties the 17th day of August 1833 as witness their seals. Sealed and delivered in the presence of Findlay Highland, who was a marble contractor of Philadelphia, signed Davis Henderson and Thomas Eustick Walter. So here is an example of not one, but multiple contracts that Thomas Eustick Walter kept record with the firm of Jacobs and Cornog, Cornog who were marble quarrymen. These contracts are in greater detail than many of the others in the book, in part due to the precise nature of the marble work required for completing the main building. You can see this reflected in each new contract that is added. Um, here we see the initial agreement with the subsequent specifications for every marble item that was to be completed by the firm. Um, this book, in fact, if you notice, has pre-printed pages with fill in the blanks for where you would uh, include this important information. However, in this case, when more contracts were added, uh, you can, uh, he actually went in, Walter went in and would cut out sheets and paste new pages um, within this book. And you can see on the next slide, those circles that I have are evidence of those wax seals in his attachment of those pages. Um, and again, here's more additions and modifications to the Jacobs and Cornog contracts. <laughs> and I have highlighted some of the details for you. Uh, the first is on September 10th, in pursuance of a resolution of the building committee of Girard College passed September 8th, 1835. So we are now at 1835. 
We, the parties in the above contract hereby agree that the length of the column block shall be altered. We also agree that the price shall be altered to $2.25 per foot of marble. We further agree to build themselves under penalty of a forfeiture of all of the reservation of the contract to finish furnish on an average of at least four column blocks per week until the whole shall have been delivered. Again, that was from September 10th, 1835. The second that we see there on the top right hand side is September 6th, a year later in 1836. Hereby agreeing the prices of the capitals, bases, shafts, and architraves, which are the beams that run across the tops of the column, shall be altered to $2.50 per cubic foot to remain in force only through 1836. So that was to reflect the uh, prices at that time. The third at the bottom there is October of 1836. You can see some modifications being made to planning. They agree that the dimensions will be fixed at an average of 230 cubic feet in lieu of measuring every block. So you can tell that there was some time management that was happening there in the efficiency of cutting that marble. Here you can see the detailed drawings Walter sent to Jacob and Cornog as well, detailing the dimensions and design of the abacuses to be placed atop the capitals of the columns of the main building. So to get an idea of the um, specification, the very specific um, dimensions that Walter had set in place. So I'm now going to talk about some of the reports by Thomas Eustick Walter. Here's the summation of the work on Girard College as it was currently taking place, as well as the cost of the Girard Trust suffered for the work over the year 1835. This was labeled by Walter as annual report informally on the back of the item. Uh, held to, it was held together with a metal pin and it contains numerous edits, edits as you can see. Um, one can assume this was a draft of the report that was subsequently submitted. Uh, there are many drafts that I found within this archival collection, as well as duplicate copies that were labeled by Walter um, to make it easy for me to spot what was original and what was not within the archival collection. So then came the financial panic of 1837 and the consequent shrinkage of assets of the estate. Um, this caused some delay in the construction of the building. The uh, Girard Committee thus determined a reassessment of the work being done on the college and sent Thomas Eustick Walter on a trip to Europe. And this trip lasted between the end of June of 1838 and the beginning of July, uh, April of 1839. And he went to study the public buildings of England, Ireland, France, Switzerland, and Italy. Walter created a very detailed report on his findings, which you can see here. The page on the left, page 24, is his observations of the roof of Westminster Abbey in London. He walked a lot of famous rooftops on this trip. <laughs> Walter's design for the college was to include a marble tiled roof, but designing one proved challenging as a marble roof can be heavy. Not only that, but Philadelphia can have hot summers, cold winters, you know, wet weather all year long. So designing the main building the way Walter envisioned within the confinements of the Gerard Will required him to study how architects of the past in Europe had designed monumental structures that stood the test of time. And so that page on the right, page 33, is his observations on the Thames Tunnel, which again, he is looking at how it is withstanding that pressure, how it is being sealed up and preventing water from, from getting into that structure. Here we have his um, observations of the Pantheon or the Church of Saint Genevieve in Paris. With his design of the interior of Gerard College taking shape, Walter studied the cupola as he had an arch design for the interior structure of the main building of the college. And there I have zoomed in the cupola and you can see the dimensions that he's included. So he was very precise even in, in his smallest drawings. To get an idea, here are some current images of the Church of Saint Genevieve. It certainly is magnificent. Building 
building of the structure began in 1757. Um, to the right, you can see more of Walter's observations of cracks in the outer walls of the structure. Uh, he does note that one of the principal causes of fracture in this building is underlined bad workmanship. The beds of none of the stones are wrought to a greater distance from the external face than five inches, which throws the weight on the outside of the wall instead of spreading it equally over the surface, the whole surface. He goes on to point out that the stones were not properly shaped, and some were even propped with wooden wedges to create a level surface, which would degrade over time. So again, he was going into these very esteemed buildings and picking apart every single detail in order to uh, better understand how they were made and to also notice any issues that were caused and how can he, he can avoid having that happen. And you can see in this um, long longitudinal view of the main building, that's uh, drawn by Thomas Usick Walter in 1841, you can see a reflection again of that design of the interior of the building. Another monument that he visited that I wanted to include as it had a very nice uh, detailed drawing within his report is the church also known as the Basilica of St. Mary's of the Angels and of the Martyrs, which was designed by Michelangelo and is the only Renaissance style church built in Rome. Here on the right, Walter has drawn a precise diagram of the building. You can see how he continued to edit his writing even in his final report with the erroneous word all scratched out. I don't know if I've said it yet, but I'm very grateful for Thomas Eustick Walter's impeccable penmanship in the process of um, creating and processing this uh, archive collection. His legibility answered many a questions that I came across throughout this process. Um, other buildings that Walter visited included the Arche de Triomphe in Paris, the cathedral at Milan, though when he visited the structure, he was not able to climb on the roof as it was during the festivities of the coronation of the Emperor of Austria, which if you have ever seen an image was a very elegant and extravagant uh, celebration. Uh, in Rome, he also visited the Pantheon and the Colosseum, as well as many temples, and St. Peter's Basilica. And again, he was honest in this report, even noting at the Basilica that it was not as awe-inspiring in person as it was necessarily hyped up to be. <laughs> So in 1841, after his travels and after construction had continued, the committee requested estimates for finishing the college, not only to keep track of finances, to, be, to get a sense of when the building of the college would be complete. Uh, this book also includes miscellaneous project expenses of Walters once the college was complete, continuing into the years 1849 and 1850. So it is safe to assume that this was his personal finance and accounts book. On these first pages, you can see here his mind at work with mathematical equations and drawings of plumbing under stairs on the left and his detailed estimates for each segment of the main building on the right. At this point as well, the outbuildings of the college, both east and west, were also being built. A month later, Walter provided a detailed 33-page written report on the remaining work on the main building, eastern and western outbuildings, as well as specifications for contracts over the next three years and payments that would be required that he submitted to the committee. And again, you can see even with the ink splotch there, um, his Im impeccable handwriting, his organization and attention to detail, even color coordinating each of the sections in this report. Um, along with the written report was a list of drawings. Although this item was not dated by Walter, a comparison of the writings and plate numbers that referenced were referenced within the drawings within the previous report concluded that this list was delivered in coordination with it. Um, I've also added a unusual drawing that I came across a few times in Walter's writing. Uh, when he needed to make a point to himself or to the reader of his reports, he drew this hand with a roughed cuff for added emphasis. <laughs> and along with this report and the drawings, he also provided the committee with a cost breakdown for the completion of the work, emphasizing that construction was indeed more expensive than originally planned based on what had been accomplished so far. 
And with that being the case, 10 days later, uh, Walter provided David Weinbrenner, who was then the chair of the committee, this again is 1841 in December, with a report detailing where the cost could be lowered. These suggestions include firstly limiting enclosure to the eastern half of the grounds, moving on to not grading the land between the buildings and streets, only laying necessary gravel and paved walkways, quote, avoiding enrichments of moldings and other elegancies, and by reducing features of the interior furnishings when it came to the plastering, painting, and carpentry, as well as placing kitchen and dining rooms in each of the West buildings, as it was originally planned to build another building between the two to house that kitchen and dining room. And that's just to name a few of the suggestions in this report. So moving on to 1843, as the construction continues, we have here the 11th annual report <laughs> written December 30th of 1843. Again, here you can see the folds in the manuscript, the label that Thomas Eustick Walter has made indicating it's his 11th report. Um, and you can see on the right-hand side of that middle image, another hand emphasizing the materials needed for the roof gutters. Again, the complexity of the uh, roof took up a large amount of time and work to be completed properly. So he definitely wanted to emphasize those notes. So here we jump to 1845. We've reached 75 pages of estimates and adjustments in Walter's book. Uh, the year to the left, you can see he has pasted estimates from Findlay Highlands, again, that marble contractor of Philadelphia. And to the right is Walter's estimates for the building of the wall enclosures of the grounds in accordance, again, within the specifications that are outlined in the Gerard will. Now, here we have a list of contractors. Although this item is labeled Contracts Gerard College, December 1846, uh, the author is unknown. It is very similar to Thomas Eustick Walter's handwriting, but as you can see, it is a lot thinner. This could just be, be because of the quill that was used, um, but I did make the assessment that I could not be 100% sure. Um, but this list, uh, again, organizes and lists each contractor, the work they provided, and the agreed upon costs. And just the first six names alone that I've highlighted are marble suppliers, followed by a brick maker, and then on the right, contractors for masonry, painting, carpentry, plastering, marble work, and marble carving. Again, in this um, in this report, having so many different um, companies and organizations and individuals involved in the process. So by 1847, here we are back at the Book of Estimates. Um, items on his list include to finish all of the carpenter's work in the main and western buildings, including what is now due. Hardware for the main and out buildings, including what is now due. Railings for the main building and out buildings. So we're reaching into the more decorative and inclusive iron work towards the end of the project. In spring of that same year, 1847 in March, Walter was asked to draft a formal announcement upon the completion of Gerard College to be published in Godey's Lady Book, which is a Philadelphia magazine publication that was quite popular at the time and which the Athenaeum also houses a substantial majority of the issues. Here you can see where Walter has combined his own writings with that of a type draft of the announcement, cutting and pasting out the portion where it will be inserted into his written essay, again, attached with those wax seals. Um, the article was used to describe in detail the monumental architectural achievement that was the building of the Gerard College. So in June of that same year, the article was published. Um, here you can see um, one of the Athenaeum collections issues of Godey's Lady Book. I'm guessing someone might have dropped it in a puddle, but <laughs> um, as I mentioned, we house most of the issues. So I was able to find the original print, the official print. Uh, for the most part, it well, obviously it is verbatim for the draft that you saw in the previous slide. 
The two images on the right I included um, is the top is the 1835 final design that Walter had done back in 1835. And this is 12 years later in 1847. And you can see that the image has been slightly altered or edited for the official print. Really the only difference being that entrance to um, the center of the um, surrounding wall that you see there. And also the people have been changed a little bit. The couple on the right in the 1835 image is riding a carriage in the 1847 image. They are just riding their horses. So here I've included three correspondences that not only showcase the variety of uh, writing I encountered, but also the variety in paper and materials that I encountered in my processing. Uh, these three, however, are all connected. The first letter is from New York on the 27th of May on the left and is a testament to the furnaces made by Fox and Co Company. And this gentleman recounts the convenient and successful warmth he received from his furnace the previous year. Uh, this letter was prompted by a request from Walter to let him know how he enjoyed the furnace. Uh, the second and center letter is also dated May 27th. It is from Staten Island. This gentleman owned, I believe, three or four furnaces um, for his large property. And he also expressed the quality of the Fox & Co furnaces he used and that the pricing of them were very appropriate for what you got. And then less than a month later on the right on June 17th, you can see that that is a letter of notice of the furnaces being shipped from New York. And again, here is the backside of those same three letters. Uh, you can see, again, the labels from Walter that he added to most documents. At this point, instead of writing out the dates, he was just listing numbers 7-47, um, as well as you can see the way in which they were folded for the mail. We also have some postage stamps on there. Uh, you can see on the document on the left, there is not a label, but there is a pencil drawing. It looks as though it is depicting different layers of marble at the base of a column, but I did find random sketches and drawings that Walter had done whenever a thought came to mind, regardless of what materials were in front of him, he wanted to get that down. On the left, you see the bill from G Fox and Co for the furnaces uh, that is against the college dated June 17th, 1847. So again, that was sent with that previous blue letter. It's the same from the same people using the same paper manufacturer. Um, on the right is an example of one of the shipping receipts. This one is from June 29th, uh, back in 1842 regarding a shipment of granite stone from Boston. Often these materials, whether they came from interstate New York, um, or what have you, they eventually wound up in ports of Boston and New York to be brought down to uh, Philadelphia. Here is just an example of other things that I came across in looking at manuscripts. Um, these are some of the more legible seals, blind stamps, and watermarks that I came across. Uh, the center seal, it still has the paper attached to it. So the seal is in between these two pages, um, but I did highlight it if you can tell there is images of a snake on the left, an eagle on the top, and a lion on the right-hand side of that chalice. So it was fun to go under a microscope and try and decipher it. Um, that wax seal on the top left being a black wax seal of a portrait, that one was also fun to find. And on the right, you have watermarks that would have been for the paper manufacturing companies. They were, these were not on every single page as these Pages were often cut from larger pieces of paper and didn't necessarily contain the watermarks, but you can see the dove on the top and Amy's of Philadelphia, Amy's Paper Manufacturing Company was one that I came across uh, fight quite a few times uh, in this process. So here we are almost seven months and six pages later from the previous estimate I showed you. We're at June 23rd of 1847, excuse me. Uh, this item list includes amounts left due on contracts, hardware, brass carpet strips, front door carvings, and the amount due on masonry of surrounding walls, including what it will require to finish it. So we are nearing the end. 
In here, we see the final list of estimates made by Walter on September 16th, 1847, his final estimates in this book. And the college officially opened three months later on January 1st of 1848. Now, although the college was open, Walter was still not a stranger. As you can see, there's a stranger's ticket on the left. Uh, it's issued to, quote, Sir Thomas Eustick, Walter and Friends, without limit of member or of day, which allowed him to visit the grounds at any time he pleased. This was not just for nostalgia. Um, work continued to take place on the campus as it did for many more decades as the college has evolved over the years. Um, but to the right, you can see an example as a result of his visit. In 1884, he wrote a condition report that was ultimately 40, 45 pages long to let the committee know how the building was doing after a number of decades. So the Girard College campus today is a 43 acre campus. It currently has 30 buildings. And here you can see where it is located here in Philadelphia. Teaching, uh, the school teaches grades one through 12. It now allows any person of color, any child of gender. And it provides quality education and preparation for college for students, for children from low income single parent or no parent households and serves approximately about 300 students each year. So the student teacher ratio is very small. It's usually one to 12. And here we have Founders Hall today, that main building that we've talked so much about. So again, it was built between 1833 and 1847. So a long time coming. It was built entirely of masonry and cast iron and paste in marble measures over 42,000 square feet and is three stories and is of course surrounded by those Corinthian columns. The image on the left is an aerial view that shows the main buildings and the outbuildings that we covered in this program from the very beginning of the 20th century. Uh, the images on the right are current and include some taken by myself during a recent visit this spring, um, as I was processing the archive, I got to see the result of all the work that I saw in progress. And so I hope sometime that you all will be able to visit the building as well. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Candace. And I see we have questions. I encourage everybody, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A or the chat if you don't have your Q&A available. But we're I will do my best the... to answer them <laughs> as best I can. Yes. She was processing, not 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 uh, deeply researching all of them. So yeah, there was there was minimal research done, especially like I said, when I needed to decipher a name or confirm somebody's identity. But for the most part, it's a very descriptive uh, and analytical process. So. Uh, did you find out as you were processing where the marble for Corinthian Hall was quarried? So it was um, a combination of mainly, uh, it was actually mainly from New York marble. I know there was at one point a Vermont marble company advertisement that shows Founders Hall. Um, but in fact, I found no evidence of Vermont marble that was used. That's usually where that question comes from. So it was mainly in New York. All right, uh, so it was from Alan, and he also says you might also mention that Thomas Eustick Walter is responsible for the interior of Christ Church at Second and Market as we know it today. He reworked the interior in 1830, just before his work on Gerard College, replacing the original Q boxes with more modern bench pews. So for those of you who are out, out here in, in the Athenaeum side of Philadelphia, you can go and visit that and see some of Eustick Walter's work as well. Uh, Frank is wondering if you know how uh, Walter was compensated. Was it a lump sum or a percentage? As he I'm sorry, on? ask that one more time. How, uh, how Walter was compensated. Did, did, was he given lump sum at the beginning or end or was he compensated? You know, that was, uh, as it was Walter's paper that I was working with, there was not a detailed account of um, exactly the money that he personally received. Um, I have a feeling based on the way that payments were portioned out, it was often, um, with the correspondences, it was often altered and thus late as there were so many changes that were constantly being made as uh, as the co college was being built. But as for Walter, I, I do not know. 
uh, for sure when he was uh, given his proper dues. <laughs> So, so Christopher is asking for your professional assessment here and why you think um, such an extraordinary architectural accomplishment is so little known nationally or even here in Philadelphia. Oh gosh, um, it's tricky. I mean, as the uh, Girard College itself is still a functioning private institution, um, they do for the most part operate still within Stephen Gerard's will. Um, and that includes visitations as well. So it is by appointment only. Uh, if you were not of a low income family in the Philadelphia area, you might not even know that this school exists or that it's currently operating. I was only vaguely familiar with it at the time. I moved, as I mentioned, I'm originally from Maine. So I moved to Pennsylvania, to Philadelphia to get my master's degree. And I knew next to nothing about the uh, building at the time. So I think that it's, it's current operating status um, and that there is not consistently public events um, and interactions with the public like we have at the Athenaeum that can increase um, viewership and knowledge, especially in our digital age with social media. Um, I think that's definitely a factor as well with so many people getting their information on the internet and the information of this college is strictly updated for its students and staff um, and anyone interested on its website. Um, I certainly think that it might be less often that someone would just come by it by chance. So of course, you know, you're, you're doing this as part of a, a, a joint project that the Athenaeum is, uh, is doing with Girard College as both of us celebrate our uh, the 175th anniversary of our building and Gerard College this year. So um, it's possible that I think they have some plans for some exhibits and doing some other work that should hopefully, um, Nathan hopefully, uh, or Christopher, <laughs> see what's question. Christopher hopefully help uh, raise its status and profile, at least in Philadelphia. That was a good yeah. question. And Nathan is wondering why it took so long to complete. Why it took so long? To complete. <laughs> well, um, finances were certainly an issue. Um, there was a lot of back and forth in terms of changes of the design. Um, Walter had to adhere to not just uh, monetary confinements, but also confinements in the will. The will was very particular. And so there was constantly questions of does this decision reflect the will? We have to have a meeting, we have to decide, does it, does it not? How are we going to change it based on what it needs to, um, what it needs to address? Um, at one point I came across a correspondence from one of the marble quarries that their crane had broken and it took several weeks for them to be able to rebuild a crane and continue um, that process. <laughs> Of, of working to, to access marble that was needed for the building. So that was certainly a delay. Um, there was also weather delays that happened during um, the foundation building of the process as well. So that, that took some time. There was really some awful storms that happened in the first couple of years. Um, so your usual house building setbacks, um, just on a monumental scale. <laughs> Um, so oh, Chris Frelson knows that there is an excellent museum in Founders Hall that's open to the public, so which should be where that, that exhibit will be. So that's another good reason to get over to Girard College and see the, see the museum. Micah wonders if you've considered the relationship between Girard College and Stephen Girard's country estate in South Philly in terms of design or social mission. I, um, I have not, I will admittedly say that I have not looked into the estate um, all that much, um, aside from its correlation within um, Gerard's will. Um, and so again, it was very much, um, he had a vision, he was a man with a vision. And as he got older, and he had such a large monetary foundation under his name, there were very particular ways in which he wanted to contribute um, to society and to future generations in that respect. So um, I do believe that there is absolutely, 
I can imagine plenty of correlation between the two. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Peitzman, who you know expresses with, with with others, you know, sorry to we're sorry to lose you here at the Athenaeum, but he's yeah. a uh, a fellow of the College of Physicians and longtime oh, user of, of its library. So looks forward to seeing you there. But he's wondering, did Walter have assistance in this and other work he did over the years, and or a key builder or contractor? Could you find um, anybody that really stood out? Yeah, he definitely Finley Highlands was one name that I came across with the most. He. Um, as I mentioned, he was the uh, marble contractor basically for the Philadelphia region. So that was a through point um, that helped with his communication um, in acquiring marble from different, from different areas. Um, for the most part, the correspondences that I had, however, were directly between these companies. Um, or individuals and Thomas Eustick Walter. There were a couple instances in which the companies were uh, being spoken for uh, through a professional that they had hired for their accounting, um, but it was not someone who was necessarily involved in architecture or brick making or making or iron working. Um, I imagine that those gentlemen most likely had some background as that was the case at that time. You usually wound up starting small like Thomas Walter and brick making and then transferring over. Um, but for the most part, it was direct contact. And uh, as for support, um, I believe that he did have someone helping him with his bookkeeping and keeping all of his paperwork in order at his offices. Uh, but for the most part, he was the head and leading voice of this entire process between these contractors and again, conferring with the committee for every single decision that he made. So Julianne wants to know what happens with this work that you've, you've undertaken. Yeah, so as I uh, mentioned at the beginning of um, my presentation, we will eventually have digital scans of a large amount of materials um, that will be put onto PAB Philadelphia Architects and Buildings. Um, and that will provide references to these materials and the details. Um, part of my visit um, to the Girard College this past spring as I was doing my work was to talk to the archivist there. Um, she actually had that question about the Vermont Marble Company. Did I come across any of it? Um, and it's, it, I believe that it will provide a reference, not just for researchers or those involved in Girard College, but they are also undergoing a, uh, will be undergoing a renovation process, just as the Athenaeum is. And so if they have any questions on what materials were used, how the stairs inside were built, I know they were um, forced into the wall several feet because they, it is all marble stairs. Um, just different decisions that were made in the construction that might answer some questions that come up as they are rehabbing the entire Founders Hall. So um, we'll see. We'll see what else uh, my work provides. I'm very excited and happy with it. Well, I think that that helps answer Catherine's question if there's been any major renovations uh, to the building. Currently, they are rehabbing and renovating the Founders Hall. Is that correct? Yeah. And then Paula is wondering if Gerard cited any sources or inspiration in his specs for the college. He did not. Um, as far as I could tell, I just, um, I, I found that free copy again on the internet archive. You are welcome to dive into it yourself or anyone who's interested. Um, you can just Google it and it will come up on the internet archive for you to access. Um, I only looked through those first few pages outlining the building. Um, they are very in depth, but he does not cite any sources. It is strictly a, this is my vision and this is what it will be. And, and that's what he left it as. <laughs> well, Christopher notes that Charles Dickens visited Girard College uh, uh, during his, 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 his uh, visit to Philadelphia. He also visited the Athenaeum. Um, and as we know, much of that visit too was 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 uh, looking on at prison reform and uh, yes. issues of, of poverty. So, um, Stephen Howard is uh, he notes the similarities of the college's side wing renderings 
with uh, Trembauer's Philadelphia Central, Central Library, which was designed 70 years later or so. And he's wondering if there's any connection between these two architects that you know of. I do not know of, um, but there really, could be. Someone on the call does though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there certainly could be, as Thomas Eustick Walter was such an influential, ar influential architect of that time, um, I have no doubt that uh, future buildings, I mean, I listed a couple, but there is upwards of, of, I believe, around 30 structures that he was involved in significantly in his time as an architect. And we have some great questions in q and I was so busy going through all the <laughs> chats that I forgot the Q&A. Jenna's wondering, if it was common at that time to send a single sheet letter without an envelope. Yes, yes, there were no envelopes. Um, and often these correspondences um, with the mail at the time, a lot of it being just in Philadelphia, I'm looking at a letter that was sent in the morning and a response that was sent in the afternoon. They have the same dates. And, you know, as there was much less buildings that were occupying the city, Again, there isn't necessarily an address on all of them in terms of the committee for the building of Gerard College. It was very apparent where that piece of mail was going to, and an address wasn't required. Um, the same with Thomas Eustick Walter. Um, they do, some of them do have his home address, some of them don't, but they are or were originally all folded in that trifold and multifold um, process and then wax sealed stamped and that was so that it came in a very convenient small pocket that was easy for someone to put in a bag and um, bring to another address. Hi, right, so Judith, um, noting that there were there were a lot of African American brickmakers uh, at that time wondered if you found out who any of the brickmakers were. Um, I can look at my list and see what I have um, for names. I don't know of them off the top of my head. Let's see here. Um, let's see here. I have James Nyblock as well. I have that's another one. That's the one that I have in this section. There's there's a number that don't, that have have names on them. Um, brick makers were actually the, the least common. I think that Walter came across a few in Philadelphia that he really trusted and stuck with them. Um, the majority of the co correspondences I had were um, mainly on the marble and on the iron. Um, but eventually when these materials come available, I just don't know the names off the top of my head. Um, there certainly can be some research done on each of those individuals um, as for whether if they're a person of color, there wasn't any note by uh, the letters or Thomas Eustick Walter in that regards. This is definitely if someone is thinking of a research project now that, that Candace has got all of this processed, it will be much easier to access for you. Um, and encourage you to come to the Athenaeum once we reopen again and, <laughs> and engage in, in, in some research. Mm -hmm. um, one last question, Warren Williams, uh, so it sounds as if Walter was acting as a general contractor. And is that true? Did he have responsibility for authorizing payments to contractors based on the actual construction progress? Yes, for the most part, it seems that he was. Again, that large book of contracts that I showed you Every single one is signed between whoever um, was being assigned for the work and Thomas Eustick Walter. So he was the involvement and he was the in-between person and he was communicating to the board of trustees and um, the committee, the Gerard College Committee, every single payment and how much was due. And he also negotiated costs um, back and forth. If something wasn't available, how could we cut something out that would lower the cost or this person needs to be adequately compensated. He definitely um, spoke up when some people were missing payments as well. Um, so he was the main person, the main contractor um, for the entire project, which is definitely a feat in of itself along with being the head architect. <laughs> 
thank you, Candice. This has been really wonderful. Thank you for your time here and knowing that you had a lot going on as you as you <laughs> finished up your coursework and graduated and you're getting ready to start new, your new job that we uh, are grateful to you for including this presentation. Um, it's been very interesting. I uh, hope you all will come back on Thursday evening, I think it is. Um, we have a virtual screening uh, along with the Boston Athenaeum of a documentary called The Crime on the Bayou. And I uh, hope you will join us for that. It is virtual again. And then um, our next virtual noon, noon talk will be on July 12th. Uh, Paul Barton Sukesian is talking about No Stone Left un Unlearned, Armenian Tombstones in Philadelphia, which would be another fascinating um, fascinating talk. So I hope you will join us for all that we have coming up. And it is so good to see all of you virtually at the Athenaeum of Philadelphia. Have a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the well wishes. <laughs> Letting everyone get their, their great jobs in in the chat. <laughs> Oh, Steve Peisman wants to know what your new job title is. Um, I am the Special Collections Project Librarian. I'll find you. Yeah, yeah, you'll find me. <laughs> I'll start next month. <laughs> All right. All right. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>